Welcome, you know who I am, Jay Abraham, and this is a very, very, very special edition of Encounter with Jay Abraham. And for this encounter, I have someone I really adore. He is a colleague, he's a friend, he's actually a business partner in another business, so I have to dis disclose that I have a... Uh, economic interest in that, but it has nothing whatsoever to do with what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk today about how your marketing can be multiplied many times over by shifting your mindset, your focus, your paradigm. And we're going to talk about a category of enterprise, I don't want to call it business, but it is enterprise, sure. that lives or dies in what, uh, six month cycles? Uh, yeah, I'd say six to 12 months. Six to 12 month cycles based on how viable, how compelling, how successful the marketing is. Most of your businesses continue. Your marketing might be good, your marketing might be bad, your marketing might be okay, but you're still around. The man we're going to interview Philip Stutz has written a book, and I'm going to tell you the name in a minute, but he has spent his career doing very, very high-yield, result-critical, the winner-die type marketing for political candidates of all kinds, and he's won far more times than he hasn't. And if you win, you stay around. You stay in business. If you lose... Your has been. The keys to his success in behalf of political candidates who become basically uh, the senators, the governors, the mayors, is what we're going to talk about today. And it's going to basically blow your mind. Philip has written a book. You can see it there. Fire Them Now. The Seven Lies Digital Marketers Sell, not just tell, and the truth about political strategies that helps businesses that help businesses win big. Speaking of win big, Philip's company, based in Washington and very successful, is called Win Big Media. And uh, welcome is uh, the wrong word. Uh, it's exciting to give you a forum because everybody knows I don't compromise the integrity of my. Uh, ideals for anybody and you have something I think everybody needs to hear and everybody needs to reflect upon and everyone needs to really carefully examine and evaluate and let's talk about what it is. So let's start sort of how you made the shift in your mind of seeing that political based marketing, advertising, uh, performance-based, yield-critical techniques were totally adaptive to any kind of business and why you realized that they were far more effective than what the uh, maddening crowd has been serving mm -hmm. up. Okay? Sure. I, thanks for having me. And, you know, uh, I created my this marketing company three years ago after I heard you speak. And what really hit me before I created the company is something you said, which is what if you treated your business like every new client you got was a referral? And it made me realize that in politics, every single client I get is a referral and it's based on my reputation. And so what I really found over the last two years, I interviewed over a hundred CEOs and they were incredibly frustrated with the digital marketing space. These, Tell me why. Because these companies and these owners of these companies used to be able to put a TV ad up, a radio ad up, send a mail piece out, and they had this massive uh, uh, you know, return on investment. Literally, it was a spray and pray, and it worked. Yes. Well, the spray and pray doesn't work anymore, and there's a frustration. And so these businesses were hiring these marketing firms, these digital marketing firms, and thinking spray and pray is going to work, and it didn't. And they also were hiring these firms that didn't put their needs first, and the marketing firm won before the business won. And in politics, because our business and is- irrespective of really whether the business won. That's right, and in politics, our, we're 100% referral and reputational. If I win political races, 
then I'm going to get bigger races next time around. If I lose, then everybody knows that I'm a loser. Uh, in 2016, our, our company did 120 political races and we won 92. We still failed, yep. but we won a lot more than we lost. And, and we, won, we won 30 creative awards and we've used all of that for leverage. But the only reason we did that, when we win, we were able to pick bigger clients. When we won awards, that means we had to perform for the client before they're not we awards won those for creativity, awards. they're awards for performance and creativity. But here's the deal: we didn't get those until after we performed for the client. We right. had to put them first, and then we reaped the rewards on our side. Got it. And so these CEOs are like, "Well, we don't get it like that," you know. And and one of the uh, examples and lies I use in the book is a long-term contract in politics because we are referral. Every contract I've ever signed in 22 years of business is a one-month contract. We're a month to month. I've never so signed. They can a long stop anytime. They can they stop want. anytime. How fast does that make me innovate? How fast <laughs> does that make me give them the best service? How fast do I have to go to win? And the fact is, we have election day. That makes me move fast too. Marketing firms on the corporate side don't operate like that. Long-term contracts where they get paid regardless of whether the business gets paid that, that's hired them. And so that I kept seeing this. And I was in China last summer with a Fortune 500 CEO, and he was telling me the exact same thing every single other CEO yes. told me. And I looked at him and I said, good God, man, fire them now. And I went, oh, that's the title of a book. Yes. And so that's what, what kind of started this. And so uh, that's, that's where great. We are. But I think it's, it, let's explore before we go into the lies. Let's explore the truths. Because you know some truths about marketing. You know some truths about advertising. You know some truths about websites. You know some truths about creative. You know some truths about the psychology of a human mm -hmm. being needs, hopes, angers, fears, trusts. Let's go into a little of that first and then let's go into the lies. Great, so um, you know, we do a lot of work, we do a lot of corporate work as right. well. And that's what we did was when we reversed engineered the way we run political campaigns to help businesses, we actually found out that we had a much stronger ROI than uh, the corporate marketing agencies did. And here's what, here's what I'll tell you. We are in a customer-generated, customer-centric economy. Today. To more than any other time in history. If you go buy a car, the customer is in charge, not the, the automobile right. company. When you uh, go to a restaurant, that restaurant knows you can evaluate them on Yelp. Yep. Uh, if you get in an Uber or a Lyft, you rate those people. The customer is in charge. Okay. And that is a problem for a lot of marketing and advertising agencies that have always run things one way. Yes. In politics, it's always been that way because all we think about is the voter. And so when we reverse engineered that, we went, oh my gosh, the, the, it was just amazing to see that. And so like, um, there was a study that came out um, last year and basically said that if, and, and this goes into how we touch voters and, and work with them and personalize those campaigns and find out what they care about. But it said that if a, a person registers to vote and they've never voted and they get a a personal contact because we go door to door in politics and we make phone calls and we get the candidate in front of them and, we, and if they get a personal contact it increased voter turnout for people that do not vote by 17 percent now you're talking about a million people let's just say a million people are voting in an election and you're able to get 170,000 new voters out just by identifying these people and having a personal connection with them and understanding what they care about and what we did was we looked at how corporate does. And, you know, Tony Robbins uses a great stat. He says it takes 16 contacts now to convert a sale on the digital landscape, right? And I'm like, wow, it's interesting because on us, in the political side, it's like eight contacts. And so, again, when we took that mentality... So you're talking about half the number of contacts to produce a... Really, uh, it's a life-changing because a different uh, constituency, a different... Uh, a different, uh, uh, what do you want to call it? A different, uh, I'll do it again. A different, a different uh, political agenda changes the whole tapestry of, of uh, a city, a state, a country, totally. a world. But here's the deal. Here's what businesses aren't getting right now. Everybody's trying to compete in the digital marketing landscape. They okay. think that they have to put all their money into that. I'm screen agnostic. Which means? I don't care 
where we advertise, I want to go to where the customer is or the voter is. Yeah, give me an example. So what we do in politics, like I said, we will identify where the voters live and we'll go knock on their doors and talk to them. And that, and that is, works. And that work, that's the 17% increase, right? Okay. When, when we work with customers, we think of how our clients and the, on the corporate side, we go, how can we personalize what you do? Yes, we're going to run TV or radio or we're going to do mail if that makes sense and the research says it and the data says it. We're going to run digital advertising campaigns, but we have to figure out a way to personalize what we're doing as well. I'll give you a great example, Jay. Um, Billy Reed is a fashion designer out of New York. Okay. My wife loves his clothing. Okay. She ordered a ton of clothing for her birthday this year or, or asked me to, right? Okay. And it came in the mail. And in the mail came a personal handwritten note from the company. It wasn't generated from a machine. It was your valuable customer. We're so grateful. Let us know what you think. If you don't like it, send it back, all that stuff, yes. right? right? And that authenticity, she is a lifetime client of them now. I mean, okay. like, and it, sure, we get their ads. Sure, they, are, they place uh, their ads in front of us all the time, and that's great. But the fact is, is they put a personal touch on what they did, and it now has a lifetime customer. And what, what, what's the implication to any business person? that you have to, well, one, you have to be authentic. Right. Uh, Sally Hogshead's a great author, and she did a study, uh, a 10-year study of 250,000 business owners. And they found that business owners that work from a place of authenticity increase their sales by 200%. And in, again, in politics, this is something we always talk about. What makes me so mad on the, on the business front is pe business owners are so scared to be authentic these days. Why? because we are in a very heightened political environment where if they say the wrong thing, they feel like their business is over with. Right. But that creates this stagnation in anything. And the marketing firms know that this is happening and they take advantage of businesses. So an example, uh, there's an, a company that, uh, I, I won't give the name of it, but I use it in some of my speeches. Um, and they put out a press release last September for uh, Hispanic Heritage Appreciation Month. Okay, and in that press release, they said uh, they would have they would honor they they wanted to honor Hispanics and do a trivia contest for their employees based on Hispanic issues. That is the most pandering, yes, gobbledygook crap I've ever heard. It's not that you don't honor Hispanics; it's you find an authentic way to tell the story of the Hispanics that work in that company, and you tell that story in such a valuable way that the customer goes, "My God, I love that story. Yes. I want to buy that product, or right. I want to utilize that company." But the marketing firm puts out a generic press release. They check a box. They send it to the company, the business owner, and the business owner goes, oh, great. "Great, yeah, the box is checked. We're good. It's crap." And what I'm saying is you can increase your sales by being authentic and putting out authentic content about who you are, what you believe. Of course, you have to be smart about it. And really, it comes down to that. And the statistics back this up. And so when I give you the Billy Reed example just a minute ago, that was an authentic move. It was a personalized move. It made my wife feel like a million dollars. And now she's going to spend thousands of more dollars right. with these people. And why don't business owners get that? Well, part of it is they're being sold something by marketing firms that they so let's shouldn't get, do let's that. get into the lies. Sure. And the one is, uh, one of my favorite lies is, we love your product. Now, marketing firms love to tell, or, or we love your product or service. Marketing yes. firms love to tell business owners that. Yes. I'm sure that there are great products and services, and I appreciate that business owners create a product and service, and they're very proud of that, and they have a... Uh, a, a loyalty to that. Yes. But I care, like earlier I said, the voter, I care about the customer. And if the customer doesn't receive that, doesn't take that product or service and it doesn't mean something to them, then you've got a, a bag of crap. You're right. And so what I, so these marketing firms will just go in there and they'll pitch these businesses. And, oh my gosh, you have the most incredible product or service. My Lord, we, we can do so many things and then they can't do anything because the customer doesn't want it, but they've been paid anyway. That's right. And so what we say is, you, we, we like your product or service, but let's figure out what your customers think. Let's figure out what your voters think. Yes. And then we do the research, we take the data, we put a plan together. Give me an example of some of the things you uncover. In business one, or doesn't matter. Voters. Anything that would help. See, I believe that entrepreneurs don't possess enough what I would call strategic critical thinking. And there's another word I'm toying with that I was introduced to by somebody else consequential thinking, which I think is 
grasping the real implications of what you're doing, saying, or not doing and sure. saying. And what's happening when you're sitting here ostrich-like with your head in the ground? So I'll give you a great example. There's um, a company called Bodega. It was okay. a startup created by a couple of Google guys okay. out of Silicon Valley. And Bodega was basically, they would put, it would be like a mini drugstore in your condominium building, in your workplace building, all these things. And it had drugs in there. It had, uh, you know, drinks and all the things that you yeah. would need, right? Okay. Cool idea. Yeah. Like it's a, you know, portable drugstore that you don't have to go down the street to. Okay. So they thought, oh, well, let's do our research and figure out what our customers think of the name Bodega before okay. they started. So the first that group they go to are Hispanics. They loved it. And Hispanic, they were worried that Hispanics oh. would be offended by the word oh, bodega. They liked it. So they went to the, the Hispanics and they, they researched them, they polled them, they did all this focus groups, they did all yeah. these things. And guess what? 96% of Hispanics said, well, that's what we call our grocery stores, yeah. our corner stores. You're yeah. good to go. And they went, great. So they announced Bodega and they put it out last September and yes. it had, this big, had all this venture capital funding behind it. And they didn't research... Uh, millennials. Okay. And millennials were offended for the Hispanics, even though the Hispanics weren't offended. And they took to social media and they basically took down the entire company. Really? Because they said it was offensive that you would have a company named Bodega. Now, had Bodega, the company, done their research fully, they would have figured this out beforehand. Another thing they found out were people, and they didn't do the research on People that live in cities that have bodegas, and I lived in Washington, D.C. for 17 yes. years, and we had bodegas in all our corners. Right. They like their corner stores. Yes. Those are families, usually immigrants, uh, yes. that come to this country and are right. working really hard, and they're loyal to them. And so by telling them, telling the big city uh, people that, that, look, we're going to disrupt your corner store and the relationship you have with them, that didn't sit well with a lot of people that lived in cities where they wanted to distribute these things initially. And so the company came down, came out, and they did not do their research, and they did not do their data properly, and they and it ban almost bankrupted the company. Wow. Yeah, and that's what we're talking about. Understand your customer before you go out and start spending money on your marketing. And it's just a fundamental thing, but so many business owners are so excited about their product and ser or service, and they get reinforced by their marketing firm that... They end up wasting money, but the marketing firm still gets paid. Yes. You know, just an intermittent uh, observation, and I'm very, very, very pleased. <clears throat> We've, we have a lot of conversation privately, but I'm pleased with what you're articulating. When I've served clients, I really always put myself first and foremost as the advocate of the marketplace. Correct. I mean, my client is really important, but if they don't really understand what value means to their market, it's moot. Sure. And value is a very, very relative, and it's a very dynamic, and unless you really grasp what they want, what they fear, what they like, what they need, you're lost. And when you try to shove your ideology <laughs> down their throat, right. it's a prescription for if not failure, certainly mediocrity. Uh, Tony Shea, yes. who founded Zappos, right. is the greatest CEO of understanding the customer. And he built his entire company on customers and culture. So his call centers, right, have real people. Right. And the mission of those call centers is to build relationships with the people that call in, a personal touch, right? right? Just like I'm talking about. A typical call center, Jay, has a 150% turnover rate. Tony Shea has a 9% turnover rate. Really? Why? Because he teaches his customer service representatives to have relationships with his callers. The, the people that do business with Zappos, he has a 70% return customer rate. So wow. 70% are return, repeat customers. Why? Because they are being treated in a way that makes them want to continue to buy the product that he's, uh, that he's selling. And so... Again, we are in a customer-centric economy, and business owners have to get their arms around the fact that they have to serve the customer before they do anything else. And you have to get your arms around the, the psychology of those customers, and that's the most important thing. And again, it goes back to like, for look, um, I'm not an influencer. 
Uh, I've been working in the weeds of politics and understanding voters for 20 years. Right. And, you know, I didn't put 10,000 in. I think I average, I looked it up. It was like 96,000 hours uh, that I've put in to understanding how the voters think. And when I translated that over um, into putting, helping customers and clients and, you know, services of, of companies, we had an exponential rate of growth for those businesses because that's the only way we know how to think. That's great. Let's talk about some other lives. Sure. Give me another one. Yeah. Uh, the one of the ones that I go back and forth is there's so many, um, again, business owners out there that go, you know what? Um, we, they hire this marketing firm and the marketing firm comes in and says, we want to test a bunch of ideas and see what see what works and what doesn't. Paper sounds good. That That's a great idea. We do that. Everybody does that. Right. But many times they'll say, look, we need... 100,000, 50,000, 25,000, we're gonna do this testing budget. Right. And we're gonna figure out what works. And it's true, in, in digital marketing, you're gonna throw 10 concepts against the wall. Your research is gonna say 10 concepts could work. You're gonna put them in 10 different platforms. You're gonna right. target it 10 different ways. And about two or three are gonna work. All right. You gotta figure that out right. before you go spend the rest of your money. Makes sense. In politics, because we are the ultimate start startup company. We start at zero. The candidate is like the brand. Right. It has no name ID. Right. And we have to raise all this money. We have to build the brand, build the name ID, convert the sale or convert the voter. And then we have to spend all our money and it's all in a nine month period. Well, you have a double, you have a double challenge. You have to get them to invest before you even have the winner. And Correct. then you've got to get them to affirm that investment really at the voting booth. That's right. So when we test, we typically do it at the beginning of the campaign to understand what these voters are thinking and the platforms they're located on and how to, com how to connect with them right. and how to convince them or convert them to vote. But we don't have any money. And so what we have to do is go do all these testing on very low budgets. Okay. And then once we know the campaign has raised enough money, we go and invest into what we know works. And too often, marketing agencies are going for the win for themselves first. Right. So they'll propose big testing budgets. Right. And then when they have a 20% success rate, they go back to the client and they say, now we know it works. Let's go and spend another 100000 So again, they get two bites of the apple. Got it. They win twice. And so what I say is in politics, it doesn't work that way. We have to do small testing, low budget testing, and then we can figure out what works. And then we'll go and, and spend the right amount of money knowing what works and, and so, so how does it translate to an entrepreneur well the entrepreneur and the business owner needs to know this that they need to go to their marketing firm and demand that if any testing takes place it needs to be in a low budget they need to prove it before they spend it and we just know that like i you know another one of the things that i talk about we talked about this earlier but like um i just i, I don't i don't have a long-term contract in anything i do because i have to innovate every day right and and these marketing agents, there was a marketing agency out of San Francisco, a, a startup a venture capitalist told me about, that, that they demand a $75,000 signing fee just to hire them before they've done any work. Okay. And an 18-month contract. And this guy did it because they had a lot of really, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. worth of VC companies they wanted this marketing company to work on. After six months, they were they had not produced any results. Really? And they were still locked into another 12 months of the contract. And they had to pay it out because they were locked into the contract. Jeez. And so the business should win before the marketing firm. I runs. agree. And that's what happens every time. And so you know, um, that's sort of the the crux. I'll give. You, here's a great example. Please. All right. So there was a special election for Congress in Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Um, and in that race, there were two hundred and twenty-five thousand votes cast, and the Democrat, a guy named Connor Lamb won the race against uh, Rick Saccone, and he won by less than 700 votes out of 200, actually 228,000 votes. Okay. Now, what if you replaced the two names of the candidates with company A and company B? And right. what if you gave those companies five months, because that's how long this, this race lasted, and right. you said, you've got five months, there's going to be 228,000 transactions, customer purchases, and after five months, the company with the most transactions is the number one in the marketplace. And then one that, the one that's in second place is out of business. Wow. Okay. That's a great And 700 visual. transactions will decide the whole game. How fast, if you're a business owner, would you move? How fast would you innovate? How much would you test and move, test and find something that works, test and find something that works? <laughs> great find point. Find, how quickly would you go? Good. And that's what we do in politics every that's day. Fabulous. And when I we took it. that mentality to businesses, we, we had explosive growth for them. So that's, to me, 
elegantly brilliant and it makes so logical sense and yet basically but you understand I'm, I'm, I'm not having an ADD moment uh, realizations and epiphanies are nothing more than seeing that which was always evident articulated in a way that you see it really more clearly and you're basically making a very logical point and I love the concept not just the analogy just made but it's a race it's a race to not just dominance but to sustainability and that race has to be won every four years or every two what, years two years right. and and that kind of performance pressure in that kind of a small window with almost no starting capital and having to self-finance is really intriguing it's really powerful uh, it's a powerful set of distinctions that I don't think anyone's ever thought about, and I love it. Let's continue. So I have another thing. It's a, it's a concept that you've taught for years, and in researching before we started working for business clients, we yes. looked into this on the political side, and we found something very interesting. And it is that when you hit voters, it was a study done. When right. you hit voters, uh, when you connect with them, when you send, touch them with advertising dollars, whether it be on the digital market space, radio, television, and you hit them in, in time periods where they're not getting inundated with TV ads yes. or digital ads or mail or phone calls or right. door knocks. If you hit them before it heats up, the la let's say the last three months of the, of the election, there's advertising everywhere. Everybody that's listening to this or watching this totally gets this, right? Yes. If you start earlier and hit them in off-peak times, you increase voter turnout by 10%. Really? Yes. And so what we did is we took that statistic wow. and we started playing around with that with businesses by saying, how could we go into, because in, on the digital side, we can directly target our people. You know, um, if I run an ad um, on your phone or your mobile device, it doesn't have to hit mine if I'm trying to run an ad that right. the data says is targeted you. Right. So I can hit you in an off period of time when every other company that's trying to get your attention isn't in the play. You can, we've found, we've had about a 5 to 10% elevation in sales uh, for the products that we've helped our customers with. And this is something you've taught because you went in and bought ad space on radio stations yep. in off peak periods. Right. So not only are we getting a cheaper rate on the I was going to say that fronts, the cost is down and the, the, and the down. yield is up. Right. Now you're hitting less people, but you're being more effective to those people you're hitting. And, and it is a concept. When I saw that statistic, I go, oh my gosh, this is exactly what Jay did on the radio years ago. He That's bought ad time, to. that unused ad time. That's right. And so we took that and started applying that in the digital front, and we've had uh, success with it. Well, it's funny. I think that there's a delusion that a lot of, very frankly, a lot of online uh, marketing companies and digital marketing companies uh, really propagate, and that's that quantity, the big numbers are what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned long ago you want... You want quality, and quality is defined in different ways. But in the terms of connectivity, you want to be able to get attention. You want to be able to convey uh, very quickly that you basically understand them, and you have either the solution or the philosophical agreement, the prescription, the protection, the enrichment, whatever it is that you have. But you can't get that message through if you're one of nine million people and so often people get diluted to buy numbers, not not really quality relationships. Sure, absolutely. And, and that's what we see all the time. I do a lot of uh, podcasts just because it's fun, and you're starting to do a lot for your book. And the people that have arranged them say, well, we're trying to get you with uh, 2 million listeners. And I say, I don't really care if it's 20,000, if they're quality people that really... That's right. Are the right profile and love the person that's interviewing me, and he or she, you know, finds my message positive enough to really support. But it's very interesting. So, what are some other lies? Well, I, I, this one would be for more of small businesses, and the small business owner is, uh, you know, when he's when he's trying to figure out his marketing. Uh, he's told by a lot of people, uh, go out and do your, you know, your branding before you convert right. the customer. 
Which uh, they don't even have a clue what that means. Correct. But in politics, it's a complete reverse. Right. We convert the voter before we brand, and then we brand second. Explain. So we have to go out and, and try to convince the voters to vote for us. Okay. And once they have committed and we have, you know, we track them, we know who's right, right, committed right. to vote, we, we call it uh, persuasion. And once we do our persuasion ads and we, ident we call them voter IDs and we right. ID them and we know they support our candidate, then we constantly brand back to them. Okay. Because we're reinforcing the message, right? right. And, and so we believe you convert first and then use the brand to really hone in on reinforcing it's that. It's interesting. Brand. And so too many marketing firms, now the big marketing firms can brand first and convert of second. Of course, they got, the big they, companies can. They got staying power and they can, That's right. know, they can be very efficient. But if you're a small business, you, you, need the go, luxury. you don't have the luxury. You need to convert and then build your brand. So give us an example. And the reason that's a lie is because if, the, if a marketing agency comes to them and says, let's build your brand first, they're yeah. getting a bite of the apple and knowing they're not going to convert customers and they're telling you we're not going to convert customers. Yeah. And then when they built the brand or they've spent all your money they go okay let's go convert the customers now right. so they get another bite of the apple and and we want see the problem with human nature and it's a good problem properly aligned with the right the right quality of person but we want so badly to believe in others caring about our best interest yeah and sadly first of all probably half of the purveyors of products and services don't. And the other half think they do, but they really don't understand the definition of the other side's best interest. And they, they, it's the concept of a carpenter seeing everything as a hammer or a nail. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. So uh, are there other lies worth delving yeah, into? I'll, I'll tell one more. Um, you got and, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, again, the con there's, a, there's a lot of context behind these, and we explain it in the book. So, But I'll make this one quick. Uh, it's the, called the ego play. Uh, a lot of marketing firms, just like they will product or service, they'll ego play the owner. What does that mean? So they'll go to the business owner and they'll go, oh my gosh, you are real. You know what? I could see us putting a marketing campaign and featuring you in it, and we want your face on it. How many real estate people do this, how many car people do this. They put the owner of the company on their mm -hmm. advertising, right. but they have no idea if that's effective or not. And they also put somebody who is not comfortable, he or she is right. so inauthentic reading a script. Correct. You're looking at him and saying, you're trying to gain my trust and you look like a whatever. And that's 100% right. And here's the problem. Uh, the business owner loves that product or service. They blood, sweat, and tears yeah, for their, their business. Baby. And then they get this marketing firm that says they want to feature them in an ad. And it just flatters the heck out and of them. And they go, here's the check. Proud father. And by the way, that doesn't work most of the time. Yes. And they lose money, and the marketing firm takes the money and walks away, and then they're left holding the bag. And so, and again, it goes back to finding out what the customer and the consumer wants. And if, that's, if it's the case where we need to put the the client or the, the candidate or the business owner on, on, a, on screen, mm -hmm. on video, then we'll do it. But the, the data has to say it first. Yeah, I fully understand. Sally uh, Hogshead has data, and I can't remember what the numbers are, but she's done all this work on fascination, yes. neutral, and actually uh, negative provocation. And people think, I mean, first of all, if you're, if you're fascinated, I can't remember what's 100, 200, 300% greater engagement, sure. sales, everything. It's 200%, all right. But number two, you can be neutral, which means it's a waste. You can be negative. Ross or Reed found this out years ago with the book Reality and Advertising, mm -hmm. where he was studying unique selling proposition. And he found out that the right one could double, triple, quadruple. But most of them were neutral, and some of them were actually negative. Correct. And and the businesses didn't even know it. They're putting all this money into something that's only uh, diluting, diminishing, eroding, uh, uh, repelling more and more potential buyers. And it's uh, and it was totally uh, what's the word I would use? It was totally toxic to relationship building. But again, I think. Many, many agencies in digital marketing, they, they don't come from what I would call deep, connective, strategic 
and critical thinking knowledge. They come from understanding uh, basically a veneer of superficiality. And it's not a criticism. It's clinical. They don't really have the knowledge to even do this. They're not in the game. They're not playing the right game. They're They're just playing, hey, I know how to get a lot of... We just did a test and we got uh, a thousand visitors or clicks to a test uh, page and nobody did anything. So, but they got us a thousand leads, but it was waste. It was moot. It was, it was actually just, you know, Oh, we only cost a dollar a click, but we didn't get anyone to call. Right. So what was the value? It was not a dollar click. It was basically the whole budget is what it cost you because we didn't get one response. That's right. So, uh, two things. One, uh, we decided, uh, and we we put this in the book, but I'll, uh, to your listeners or viewers, I'll um, I'll offer it. Uh, we decided to help businesses get in the game mm-hmm. and ta- and put the power back in their hands. And so we created what's called a free digital footprint audit. Basically, a business owner goes on uh, to we have we create a page. It's my name, philipstutz.com backslash audit. And what you do, it takes five minutes. You fill out your publicly available information on all your digital platforms. Uh, and my team goes in for free, and we will evaluate everything you're doing. And we'll tell you where you stink and where you're really good. And will you tell them why? And well, yeah. So what we'll do is we'll do this full evaluation. It takes about five business days. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll do a conference call with you afterwards, and we'll walk through. And we'll also give you, if you improve these things, how you can improve your, your return on investment, a percentage of return on investment that you should expect if you can improve these things. And we what we do irrespective for, of whether they want you to do it or just learn how to do it themselves it's, with it, logic. It's absolutely free service. Yeah. And my thing was it uh, you know, people don't go to Home Depot to buy caulk proactively. They do it because there's a hole in the wall. <laughs> I love it. Right? That's a great picture. And so if I can help them buy the caulk and fill the hole, I'm happy to do it. And I wanted to provide service to to them for that. And so uh, again, it's this. We call it the free digital audit. We'll look at everything they're doing from their video content. We even manage. We even monitor if they're sending out emails, what the content looks like, how they can improve it, and all that. And then we'll give them a grade, and we'll tell them what they're doing right and wrong. I think that's great. And I happen to know that it, that the way Philip does it is very authentic. It's not a teaser to get you just to respond. He's very sincere about. He's on a, a mission and a crusade, which is what I've done all my life to see deserving entrepreneurs stop basically under underperforming, under yielding, being restricted, limited, because they're trusting people who may think they have your best interest at heart, but their actions belie their words. Real quickly, I'm just gonna go through titles and you can either make a comment or not, but I'm gonna say to everybody, here's the book, Fire Them Now, The Seven Lies Digital Marketers sell, not tell, and the truth about political strategies that help businesses win. Uh, I was proud to write a forward because I think Philip has a piece of the puzzle. And when you see someone who's got what I would call a more logical, we're on the the, the uh, base of a great airport and you saw heard a, a private jet take off. When you hear the logic, the irrefutable logic, Philip is preaching and then you look at the actions your business may be taking because you're being guided by somebody who really may be well intended and may be very good at understanding how to get you gross response but doesn't have a clue how to get connection how to really speak truly authentically to the needs the feelings of the audience it's tragic given how much you trust others. Some of the titles of the chapters, you must innovate now. Remember, Philip doesn't have three years and a $2 million budget. And he's got somebody who's got virtually nothing but a mission, a cause, you know, a, a uh, their own crusade in behalf of the voter, excuse me. Number two, expose the marketer's lies. These are the lies that he asks you to reflect upon and see if you've been unintentionally 
or intentionally victimized. Get off your ass and move fast. I mean, uh, I've always been impacted by a phrase that uh, Gary Halbert, who's deceased, said, and it's, more happens in the life through movement than has ever happened through meditation. Mm. And another person who I know, and I was a, uh, uh, a, a mentor to, uh, Michael Masterson, wrote a book called Ready, Fire, Aim. Aim. <laughs> it is a cool, it's a it's cool a great book. Title. It's Well, it is, and it's true. But it's people in many, many, quote, professional digital marketing agencies will have you believe you have to do all these very sophisticated things before you can get uh, an answer. I've always believed the first thing you do is try to conservatively get indicative feedback, even if it's not absolutely mm -hmm. definitive. Then you can go and you can spend more or go deeper into that direction. Mm -hmm. But you know, putting that kind of capital at risk when you're a smaller business is unbelievably uh, imprudent. Your number one priority, what is it? It's targeting. Okay. It's targeting. In politics, that's our number one priority. When I sit down with a political candidate, I, I definitely care about what they are going to run on, but I say, what do the voters think? And your number one priority is to figure out what your customers want to think. That's great. Nobody likes a robot. What's no, a robot? That's inauthentic. Uh, behavior, which uh, if it's, you... it's, I call it gobbledygook. Okay, people put out a lot of gobbledygook, uh, and I'll give you a great example. Of just something that happened today. There, the, recently, there was this Southwest Airlines uh, yes, tragedy and accident. Yes, uh, the they've since done a pretty good job on the PR front. But the first day, they put out a video on social media from the CEO, what and, say? and I said, "Oh, that was good. They put out a video because that's what people yeah, are true. watching. Yes. Everything right now is video. Yes. Everything." Okay. And he read from a teleprompter. Oh, geez. And I went, no, no, no. I couldn't even make it through the video. So there's no authenticity. There was no authenticity. If it was me, or if I was guiding this person, I'd say, get rid of the teleprompter. Just say what you feel. And say, I'm heartbroken today yeah. for these families. Yeah. I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. We're damn well going to figure it out. And we're going to take care of everybody I on absolutely that flight. Agree. How easy would that have been? But the lawyers got involved. The, the marketers got involved and they said, don't rock the boat. Don't be authentic. And the damage controllers. And, yeah. <laughs> and the liability That's protectors. Right. Uh, go negative. The number one strategy in this book that could give any business explosive growth is in this chapter. It is not only was it the most fun chapter you'll chapter read in the six. book. But it is the one outlier strategy that in a disruptive economy that we're in right now, right, where all these businesses and the whole economy is being disrupted, that if businesses applied this strategy, it would have explosive results for them. Okay, but you're being teaser. Can we give a little peek so, behind the curtain? So you've watched negative political advertisements in your day, right? Of course. Do you like them? I don't know. I Do you get annoyed of, by them? I get provoked by them, Yeah, yes. most people go, I hate them. However, they work. Better? Well, they work or we wouldn't use them. Yes. And so I decided, why, why aren't we doing, why isn't there more of this in the corporate world? Now, I don't mean like we do in politics where we take a sledgehammer to someone's head yeah. and knock them out of the game. But what I mean is using comparative advertising. Yeah, if you aren't slandering and you're using, right. If you, but I, I've always done that. Comparative advertising to your competition, especially an underdog in the marketplace, can give a business explosive. And I agree totally. Growth. And business people don't realize it. And they're they're so afraid of so afraid of looking bad as opposed to feeling, hey, if you have a superior product, performance, service, solution, support, outcome, why wouldn't you want as many people who need it and and desire it to get it from you rather than somebody who's gonna the deserve deal. them? I give tons of examples of how to do it. There is a way to do it that doesn't offend a single person. Okay. There is a way to do it that gives you unbelievably amount, unbelievable amount of free advertising, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And doesn't you explain cost, it all here. And I explain it all in that chapter. And it is the most fun chapter mm. you'll read. Uh, but it's also businesses are too scared to do anything these days. And what I've said is here are the businesses that have done it and look at what yeah, happened. You, and I think everyone needs a reference example, case study, metaphorically, 
that you can feel comfortable at least to try very conservatively. I, I just, and at the end of every chapter, and this is advice you gave me. Yes, it's got a it's, summary it, of what, you, what well, the message is. It's a summary and, and then it's a challenge the for action. each business owner. And That's it's great. Easy, they're easy one-step challenges. That's great. That's uh, easy. Great. Here's a simple step you can take to try this out and test it. So two more, and, it, and, yeah. and I can go through the whole. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this is a great book. So when the doo-doo hits the fan, what's that mean? <laughs> So too many businesses, again, if we're in a customer centric economy, right. businesses are going to screw if up. The we, customer is we are, go, right. The customer is going to complain. Yeah, it's statistically it's impossible it, not to. It could be a loss. over critical, <laughs> over over uh, you know, accessible and, and over expectant market. You're right. Uh, there could be a lawsuit. Yep. Uh, there are bad Yelp review. Yep. Uh, it could be a number of things. And too many business owners, when some kind of crisis hits, they have no plan, and they bury their head in the sand, they hope it goes away. Yes. And I try to lay out how to do, how to think differently when this happens and I how agree. to prepare differently. And look, I come from Republican politics. This book is not partisan at all. It is about marketing strategies. But in this chapter, I interviewed Donna Brazil, okay. who was running the Democratic National Committee right. when it got hit by the Russian hacks. And, and she explains how they handled that crisis. And it's very fascinating to look at how, when the Russians broke into their servers and exposed all their emails, how they looked at it internally, what they did behind the scenes to prepare and to try to protect their customers, their donors, yes. and how they handled it on the media front. And it's a really good case study, regardless of your politics. It's a really good case study and for businesses to look at and go, you know what, I need to think about this because something will happen one day. I always say, you know, Andy Warhol's comment, you know, everybody has 15 yeah. minutes of fame. Same In thing. politics, you always have 15 minutes of, oh shit. Yeah. You know, and th it's going to come. It Everybody's going to have know when and where you better have. And, and are you prepared or not? We lay out how they do it, especially on the That's digital fabulous. front. And I want to say something. <clears throat> I've advocated for years what I call the Aikido School of Marketing. Mm. Anybody knows what Aikido is? It's a martial arts form that uses the power of the enemy against the enemy. And, Everyone tries to avoid or hide or do diluted damage control. And I think the first thing is if you can't avoid it, you embrace it and you make it right and you use it as an opportunity to actually endear yourself even deeper and at a higher level to your target market. And you know who just did this was Tony Robbins. Yeah. He handled how did he do it? his Explain. controversy. So he was at a Unleash the Power Within event, and he was talking about the Me Too movement. Right. And he deeply offended um, one of the women in the crowd. And there was a video of him. It went all over. And it went all over. It was He handled it as brilliantly as anybody I've what ever he seen. Do? He owned it. He apologized authentically. Yes. He didn't say, if I offended any women, like yeah. the if I offended, yes. right? You know, you should yes. just go to jail for yeah. that right now. Yes, I believe right. anybody should. So he handled it. He said, I could learn from this moment. Uh, I've dedicated my life to helping other people. He laid out that he spent his whole life helping people. He will learn from this. He's listening and he's sorry. Yeah. And it was a brilliant... And it was authentic. And it was totally authentic. And it's a case, people should write case studies if they want to look at what business owners want to do in a crisis moment. I think that's brilliant. But guess what? It also came from his heart. Yeah, I know. I know, Tony. And he would not say something that he does. It was just like that. I mean, it was, I think. It was I, not strategic. It was, you felt it. And you can tell he is learning and he's reflecting. Yep. But when you see somebody own it and really uh, not try to say, well, I didn't mean it. Oh, it was misinterpreted. I, I that. I mean, integrity requires you to really have a code of conduct that you adhere to. And it means not just expressing what you think, but being willing to accept the consequences and make it right. That's right. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you'll fail. I thought we are going to win. <laughs> Ha. Well, in politics, everything we think about is how we win. Okay. But the fact is, is that we fail all the time. Specific. We don't win every race. You know, there, listen... Uh, in 2010 and 2014, 2016, Republicans won a lot of races. Right. And in 2018, there's a good chance Republicans are going to lose a lot of races. You're right. And the problem is, what do you take from that failure and how do you grow and, and how does from it? it? How, do, yeah, how does it propel you to be better and you to be more, as you say, client or or customer or target market centric? Absolutely. And also authentic. 
Correct. And and be an advocate and a champion of their needs, not yours. Correct. That's very smart. Uh, disruption is coming. It sounds like Paul Revere on his horse. Disruption is coming. Disruption is coming. Knocking on every door. Well, my thing is there's nobody that's ever written about how political strategies can help business. And we're in a disruptive economy. And I'll get the example I give is that, of course, everybody knows about Uber and yes. how disruptive it was and all that stuff, the Uber economy and all that stuff. But it's not Uber. It's the second order consequences of all the disruption that's Meaning coming. Meaning what? So let's take automated cars. Okay. All right. We know that's coming. That's the first order, right? Right. Uh, but what does that do to state governments when we no longer have traffic tickets and, and speeding tickets and parking tickets anymore because automated cars will, will, will be abiding by the rules? What happens when we have 38 that well, so we know that automated cars are going to be 99% safer when they're finally hit the road right. than than human driving cars. What happens to emergency room nursing nurses? How many of them will lose their jobs because we don't have accidents or deaths from automated cars anymore? What is going to happen to those people? What happens to car insurance when you're not driving and the car is 99% safer? It's gone. And then the, the second order consequence is what happens to organ donors? And there are no more <laughs> oh, wow. car accidents. That's People profound. People on organ donor lists are going to be sitting. 90% come of them come out of accidents. Correct. And the wow. people that are on organ donor lists are going to be in a different place. So, and, you know, I can go ahead. No, they that's are, they fabulously are, interesting. Th they're 3D printing houses that right now that are 90% lighter and a thousand times stronger than the houses being built right now. So if you're building those kind of houses near the beach where there are hurricanes, yep. what happens to insurance when your house is not going to blow down anymore? What happens to the construction industry when the way they or the wood industry or the timber industry? What happens? Here's another one that'll blow your mind. Nineteen percent of greenhouse gases come from land animals. They are now taking the cells of cows and 3D printing steaks. This is true. Really? Yes. You can go on YouTube, watch how they do it. And it tastes like, a, it is a steak. It tastes like a steak. Same protein. Same protein, same everything. It's wow. completely clean too. What happens when we eliminate 90% of cows in this country? What happens to farmers? What happens to all that land that they used to graze on? Like everything is being disrupted. Everything. We're in the middle of this. It's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. And if you're a business owner and you're not saying, you know what? I need to think differently. I need to get in the game. I need to disrupt my own business. I need to innovate. I need to think differently. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add one piece of the puzzle to that mix. I'm trying to think, help them think in a very innovative and different way on their marketing. And you're, you're, but you're actually having them think incredibly more logically and critically. Mm -hmm. It's not out of the box. It's actually probably more profoundly logical than everyone else is asking them to think. Most everyone is saying, emperor has no clothes, don't worry about it. It's That's right. They're the equivalent, really, of the same things that the, that everyone else was doing. They're, what do you call it, when you just mass mailing, mass, you got a great, great phrase for it. Uh, spray and pray. Spray and pray, but it doesn't work <laughs> that way online, yeah. does it? No, it really doesn't. Uh, it, I, does, it can't. If you're, like, we can target the customer Perfectly now. Yeah, and, it, and time and, and receptivity and when they're the most, the, the, the least cluttered, the most relaxed, the most impressionable. So we sat down with Google and Facebook almost on a weekly basis. Okay. And they came to us two years ago and they said, you need to change your business model. We're moving into all video. Everything is going to be about video. You have to put everything you do into video. All your business clients need to be putting out video. All your political clients need to put out video. We ended up in creating uh, an entire uh, video creative production team. Like we hired them in house. We did everything without having the business. So you you were ahead of you because you knew you're going to need it, and, and that was coming. Sorry. Right. So when we you know so like. Uh, you know, and what we found is now when we've been doing these audits is we'll find people that have very old websites yep. and they have no video content on their websites right. and your website is either a transactional place or it's a resume. Yes. And if you have stuff that's not up to date, that it doesn't matter that websites aren't important anymore because they're really not important, but they are important because it's so visual. Yes. And if you're not up to date on all that stuff then you're out of the game but before it even starts. Your customer sees it and says, I'm not doing business with them. They've got this old dilapidated website. I'm not doing that. And so my whole point is that you've got you've to get in the game. You've got to understand what the rules are. And you've got to innovate because everything's changing. There's a great quote, and I'm going to miss 
uh, paraphrase it from Peter Drucker, the great management guru who's now deceased. And it was something to the effect that if you're not constantly committed to making your business, your product, your service, your strategy, your business model obsolete, you can rest assured that every one of your competitors is committed to doing it to you and for you. That's right. And so, I mean, if you're an ostrich, it's your prerogative, but the world doesn't care. It's going to change. That's right. And the implicate, what you just said are the implications of this positive negative domino effect are profound and this consequential thinking is needed. Uh, this is great. This is wonderful. And I really am, I, I, I'm always profoundly reflective when you and I talk. And I think you're very brilliant. But I think what's really interesting, and I need to make a, a wonderful declaratory statement, that you're interested in entrepreneurship like I, but you don't really care. You, you know, you'd love someone uh, to seek you out who's a billion dollar company, but you're just as happy if it's a million dollars or two, as long as they're ethical, as long as they're uh, uh, attitudinally collaborative and that they're open to not new thinking, but the right thinking. It's alignment. Yeah. Well, I, I seek alignment. Yeah. I, I, I want to be aligned with their goals and they be aligned with the way we want to help That's them. That's fabulous. And I love, I mean, we did something for years. It was called, uh, it was, it was a, it was a self assessment. Yours is much better because you're imputing all your knowledge and your, and your experience. But ours would say, how does your business really stack up? And at the end of it, people would realize how off target their trajectory of thinking, actions, expression through their marketing was, and it would be self-evident. You give them actual constructive assessment or compliments if it's deserved. Mm -hmm. And if it's negative, it's not accusatory. It's say, here's what you need to do to make that part of your business perform optimally. Here's what you have to shift. It's pretty cool. I am, uh, I'm comfortable enough with Philip that I'm going into a venture with him. And as I said, it has nothing to do with this. I don't gain one iota if you buy the book or not, although I think you're really, really imprudent if you don't. I gain nothing if you uh, go and take his uh, assessment and let him uh, evaluate it. I gain even nothing more if you become a client, but I think he's got a piece of the puzzle. I'm always looking. I'm obsessed with people who have a piece of the puzzle. No one else does because it gives you advantage. And all of life in business is if you have more ethical advantage than your competitors, you win. And this is about winning and not waiting until you're almost dead and retired to get the prize, but enjoying it continually and compoundingly and, um, and and really being passionate about the process. I uh, want you to repeat how they get the how they get the book, you didn't say that, and how they get the assessment. So the book's on Amazon, it's easy as that. Okay. And uh, the assessment is, you can go to one of two places. You can go to winbigmedia.com or you can go to philipstutz.com backslash audit. And it's S-T-U-T-T. Yeah, uh, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S-T-U-T-T-S. Right, dot com. Dot okay, com I, I, I'm thrilled to get your message out. And I mean that very sincerely. It pleases me to help people think differently, but they think that thinking differently is innovatively. In many cases, it's just, it's just uh, thinking more logically, mm -hmm. don't you think? Mm -hmm. Totally. All right, thank you. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Okay, good luck. Thanks.